As introduced, I am Matthew, and this is my middle giant, Ruth. <laughs> We've been here for about three years, uh, and in almost every ministry there is of the church in some form or fashion. So this morning, our reading will be from the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. You can find this in your pew Bible, starting on page 1712. I'll give you a second to turn there in case you need to go find it. Acts 13, verses 1 through 12. Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant at the, of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Alimus the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting to the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. This is the word of God. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Well, this spring and through the summer, we're looking at the book of Acts. We're picking back up at, uh, in the book of Acts where we left off on the last Sunday before lockdown. But we're also picking up uh, from the book of Acts because it is good for us. I think it's, it's good for us to look at this this time. It's, Acts is a book about the mission of the church. Uh, as we saw last week, it gives us a picture of what the church is to be about and where the church is to be going. Uh, and so uh, for several weeks throughout the spring and into the summer, we're going to be talking together about this, looking at this picture of the mission of God in the world and the church's part in that. Uh, to know Christ and make Him known is what is written on the front of your bulletin. It's the mission of this church. To know Christ and make Him known. And here in chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, we have a picture of this second part, making Christ known. God's mission in the world to make Christ known uh, all around the globe. Uh, this is what we have a picture of here. We have a picture of Christian mission as the first Christian missionaries are sent out from Antioch into the world. Luke is giving us not only a historical account, but a picture of mission. So what is it that we see? What is it that we learn here for us today in what it means to be about the mission of Jesus in the world as a church? Three things I want us to see. Three things. Three different aspects that this passage tells us about what it means for us to be a part of God's mission today as Penny Memorial United Baptist Church. Three things. What is God's mission in the world. Uh, Christian mission is three things. One, joining, I'll give them to you right up front, joining a spirit-led movement. That's first. Uh, joining a spirit-led movement. Second, it's making a reasonable argument. It's part of what it means to be a Christian mission. And then third is to engage in spiritual conflict. See, all three of these here, all three of these, joining a spirit-led movement, making a reasonable argument, and engaging in spiritual conflict. Now, joining a spirit-led movement. Right from the beginning, one of the things that's most striking, these, as I said, are the first time missionaries are officially sent out by the church to take the gospel to places where it hasn't been before. And what is very, very clear from the account in Acts chapter uh, 13 is that uh, the one who called this shot, the one who ordained the mission, the one who came up with the idea in the first place, the one who sent the first missionaries out, 
this was none other than God himself speaking through God the Holy Spirit. This was not a human plan for world domination. This was not a charismatic human leader saying, I'm going to build a movement. This was God himself saying, we're going to go. You're going to go. This mission is going to spread from here to the ends of the earth. It is a spirit-led mission. So you see in chapter 13, while, verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. No account of how the Lord said this and made this clear, but he made it clear to all of them, Paul and Barnabas are to be sent out. And then, just in case we miss that in verse 4, the two of them sent on their way by who? By the Holy Spirit. And one of the first things to see, this is a movement. The Christian church is a movement. It's part of a movement now for 2,000 years that has deep roots, in fact, roots in the very heart and person and nature of God. It goes way back, Christian mission. It goes way back, this movement. Uh, this is, theologians, just to talk about this, this, this helpful concept of the processions of the Trinity, which sounds abstract, but let me just... Flow this out, uh, fill this out with you. God in his very nature, according to scripture, is a God who is constantly moving out into the world with love and grace and salvation. So from the beginning, God creates everything, but when the world falls, when the world falls into sin, God the Father, it says in Ephesians, before the, even the creation of the world, knowing it would fall into sin, into, to sin God the Father says, we're going to redeem it. We're going to fix it. We're going to bring salvation to sinners. God the Father makes a plan, Ephesians says, way back before anything was even made. And then when the world falls into sin, God says, now here's the plan. And the God the Father says to God the Son, now you go. He sends the Son. You go and bring that salvation. And the Son willingly comes. He lives and He dies and He rises and He ascends. He does all the heavy lifting. He finishes the work. He accomplishes salvation. The Father makes the plan. He sends the Son. And the Jesus does it all that is needed for salvation. For the reconciling, it says in Colossians, of all things. Jesus comes to heal everything that is broken in God's good creation so that all things, things in heaven and things on earth, it says in Colossians 1, might be reconciled. So, as J.R. Tolkien puts it, everything sad may be made untrue. God the Father says, let's fix it. He sends the Son. The Son does it all. He says on the cross, it is finished. And now you have this finished work, but you have a world full of brokenness and sinners who need this gospel, this good work of Jesus applied to them. You and I who need this good news applied to us. And so it says in the Scripture, the Father and the Son send the Spirit who comes to make us new, to show us Jesus, to bring us to God. And so you see, from the very, the very nature of God is God the Father makes a plan and He sends the Son and then the Father and the Son send the Spirit. And guess what? When the Spirit comes in and takes residence in a person's life, when you become a Christian, you are, the Scripture says, filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And as the whole person of God from before creation is moving wave after wave of grace out toward sinners, out toward brokenness, out with healing, if you get grabbed by this God, you are carried out in the very movement of God out into the world world that God that needs the gospel of God it's in the deep in the nature of God you see this is not something that started in Antioch this is something that is rooted deep in the very nature of God the missionary God and so join joining the Christian church being joined to Jesus is joining a spirit-led movement it's a movement Jesus said in John 20 21 to 22 John 20, 21, and 22. I'll just read it to you, but you can mark it if you're interested. Jesus said after his resurrection to his disciples, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And so this thing is not an optional thing. You can't say, well, the church is maybe about mission. Mission is at the heart of God and at the heart of who the church is. And it is joining a movement that actually engages all of us. So when you look, it was the Holy Spirit moves on the church and says, let's go. Uh, notice how many people are involved. It's not just Paul. Uh, Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, are set apart. So there's 
Paul goes with someone else, and if you read through the Acts, you see he's always doing that. He's always going with others. He's always a part of a team. He's never a solo operator. Uh, Paul and Barnabas go, and in fact, it's not just Paul and Barnabas. It says in verse 5, when they had arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. That's John Mark. They brought along someone else, and John Mark seems to have been, we don't know what he did, but except that he was their helper. He, he served. He came alongside them. So now you have, you have not just Paul. You have Paul and Barnabas. You have not just Paul and Barnabas. You have John Mark, who's helping, working with details, carrying the books. I don't know. And not just that. You have the church. The whole church prays for them and sends them out. And it says in Acts chapter 14, when they had finished the mission, they came back to the church that had sent them, that prayed for them and was praying for them and no doubt was supporting them financially. They came back to the church and said, here's what happened. Do you know why? Because it was not just Paul, it was Paul and Barnabas. And it was not just Paul and Barnabas, it was Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. And it was not just Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, it was Paul and Barnabas and John Mark and the whole church. The whole church that sent them out and welcomed them back and prayed for them and supported them. It's a movement. It's a movement. And you know, this is, this is one of the wonderful things about being a part of the church. That human beings need purpose, and what the Christian faith does is give you a purpose that is big, that is global, that is ancient, that is relevant right now. It's the mission of God. You know, Sebastian Junger, who is a writer, he wrote... Uh, a book, uh, the place we used to live and serve in Gloucester, Massachusetts. He wrote a book about fishing there called The Perfect Storm. Maybe saw the movie, George Clooney. <laughs> but he also wrote, he's written different things about uh, uh, service men and women and PTSD. He wrote a book about the struggle of uh, people who've served in the armed forces coming back and, and settling back in to uh, American life. And one of the things that he argues is that part of the reason why this is so difficult is not because serving overseas was so hard, though it is. It's because serving, uh, serving in, particularly serving in combat, you are rooted together with people who you are literally putting it on the line for one another day after day. You have a high purpose. You have deep community that's formed in this purpose. And then you come back to modern American society where we say, you're on your own. He says, he says people, human beings don't mind hardship. This is what he writes. Human beings don't mind hardship. In fact, we thrive on it. What human beings mind is not feeling necessary, not feeling needed. Modern society, he wrote, has perfected the art of making people feel not necessary. What's your purpose? What's your team? What are you a part of? And what, what the Christian mission says, what Jesus says when he says follow you, is you come and you join my movement with my people. You have a purpose. You are needed. Let's go. Every one of us. And there's great fulfillment in that. I was talking to my wife um, and father and mother-in-law last night about the ice storm of 98. How many of you remember the ice storm of 98? I do not remember the ice storm of 98. <laughs> 98, there was no ice in Oregon. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, one of the stories that I've heard, beyond just the fact of how hard it was and how memorable it was, one of the things that I've heard is how memorable it was when, the, particularly the instances where people came together to make it through the storm, where they shared things with one another. And the, the radio broadcast about, hey, I've got extra blankets, here's where you can pick them up. And, all of, and, and people sharing homes and who had power invited everybody over. And the way there is something about when a whole bunch of people come together around a purpose that is deeply fulfilling and memorable, the hardship is not uh, something that crushes us. What crushes us is feeling like we've got everything we need and we're all alone with no purpose. Jesus says, come and join my purpose. It will be hard, but you're in this together. And he also says this, if you're a Christian, you're needed. We need you. We don't need you on the bench. We need you in the game. And so the first challenge, this is the first thing about Christian mission. Christian mission is joining a spirit-led movement. And if you don't know where you're fit, here's, fit, here's my challenge. Ask God today, say, where do I fit? Talk to a friend today and say, where can I serve? Start seeking or just jump in. Because this is part of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Christian mission is a spirit-led movement. That's the first thing. It's the second thing. Here's the second thing. Uh, as they go off, what do they do? They make a reasonable argument. 
uh, you know, it's really interesting. As, as they go out, this becomes, they establish what becomes their pattern. And if you read through Acts with us this summer, you'll see this happens over and over again. What do they do? They go out. And the, what they do is they first usually go to a synagogue, almost always. They first go to a synagogue, and they just start making the argument that Jesus is Lord. Uh, they just go in and start telling people this is what it's about. And they start making the case. And then when... The, as increasingly as they go on, they go other places. They go into the marketplace. Paul goes on to a, a Mars Hill, and he just begins to say, let me tell you, let me, ar- let me argue with you in a, in a friendly sort of way. Let me compel you. Let me try to persuade you. Let me tell you the reasons why I believe. They make a reasonable argument. It's part of the central of what Christian mission is. They don't browbeat. They don't manipulate. They don't start up a circus and like, try to get everybody around with a crowd. They just go in and begin to talk to people and make an argument. A reasonable case. And in fact, that's what this first, uh, this one of the first uh, people that they encounter who shows a real interest and becomes a, a follower of Jesus through their ministry, this is what he wants. It's really interesting. So if you look down at verse 6, it says, They traveled through the whole island, the whole island of Cyprus, until they came to Paphos. And there they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus. We'll come back to him in a moment. Who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. And then Luke, who just gives us, you know, they, they had lots of encounters. Luke is picking certain encounters to tell us about, to give us a picture of Christian mission. And it's really interesting what he tells us about Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Luke is showing us that this, this gospel, this good news, is for everybody. Here's a Greek man. Here's a Greek proconsul. He's no doubt trained in Greco-Roman philosophy, religion. He's a smart man. Luke tells us that. He's an intelligent man. He's interested in these kinds of things. And he's actually interested. He invites Paul and Barnabas in to talk to him uh, because he wants to hear what they have to say. He wants to know, do they have something to say that is relevant? Do they have something to say that is believable? Do they have something to say that is reasonable, that helps make sense of my life and what I believe? He's interested. He's curious. He wants to hear what they have to say. And they come and they speak to him. They make a reasonable case. In fact, there is a miracle. We'll come to that in a moment. But look down at verse 12, where it shows how the proconsul came to faith, Sergius Paulus, it says, when the proconsul saw what had happened, this is a miracle, no doubt. When he saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed by what? The teaching about the Lord. His faith did not rest primarily upon the miracle that he saw, but upon the, the persuasive power of the Word of God to make sense of his world and his life that then seemed to also be backed up by this miracle. It was a reasonable argument. He was an intelligent man. Uh, And this is what it is uh, to be on Christian mission. Uh, We go out and we make a reasonable argument. We we attempt to, uh, with, with winsomely and gently and truthfully, help people understand the truth of the gospel of Jesus. You don't have to, you know, I've heard it said, Jesus came to save us from our sins, not to save us from our brains. In fact, this is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12. Jesus says, this is my command, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. I skipped one. What was it? Mind. Mind. From the words of Jesus, that you love the Lord with your mind. That you think about it. Paul says, when he stands later before Festus and King Agrippa, two Roman leaders, when he's on trial, he makes the case for Christ, and I, I want you to hear this, it's in Acts chapter 26, verse 24. He gets interrupted. He's speaking in Acts chapter 26, and Festus interrupts him and says, you're out of your mind, Paul. Your great learning is driving you insane. And listen to Paul's response. So he knows this guy's smart, but this doesn't make any sense. And this is Paul's response. He says, I am not insane, most excellent, Fest- excellent Festus. What I am saying is true and reasonable. He seeks to persuade. And so engaging the mind is a consistent theme through Christian history. Jesus taught us to love the Lord with our mind. He, he, he made brilliant arguments. Uh, he, he, even when he was put in tough spots, he answered brilliantly. Did you know that the first universities were formed by Christians? Did you know 
that one of the first pastors of this church came from Waterville College. You know which one that is? Colby College, which was founded by the Baptists. And did you know that one of the pastors of this church, do you remember uh, Pastor Oren B. Cheney? If you say yes, I'm calling your bluff. <laughs> he was pastor from 1852 to 1856. Oren B. Cheney, if you're still here from that time, we need to talk. <laughs> he was a pastor of this church, and then he was the first president and one of the founders of Bates College. Colby College and Bates College, founded by Baptists who sought to love the Lord with their mind. Now, Christian teaching is not proclaimed <laughs> regularly on those campuses today and may not always be welcome. But we haven't changed. They have. We follow Jesus who says there is a reasonable case to be made. Your mind should be engaged. And Christian faith continues to, continues to compellingly answer the deepest questions of the human heart. Where did I come from? Why am I here? How should I live? What happens when I die? Why does life matter? Christian faith compellingly gives reasonable answers to those questions in a way I am convinced no other philosophy or religion does. And the Christian job is to make that case. Listen to what Peter said. By the way, uh, Peter was, uh, when he stood to make this case, he was, uh, the Pharisee said, he stood to make the case for Jesus, it says in Acts 4. And the Pharisees looked at Peter, who was a hardworking fisherman, blue collar guy, and they said, He's unschooled and ordinary. I won't make you raise your hands, but if you're unschooled or ordinary, you can just raise your hand in your heart. You don't have to be a professor to be able to do this. Peter was a hardworking man who nonetheless stood up and it says the Pharisees looked at him and, and said he was unschooled and ordinary, but they saw this. He had been with Jesus. And he gave compelling testimony to the difference that Christ had made in his life. This is what Peter wrote years later. 1 Peter 3.15 and 16. Always be prepared to give a, an answer. Other translations. Always be prepared to give a reason to everyone who asks you for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Christian mission is first joining a spirit-led movement, and then it's second, it is making a reasonable argument. Here's the question, not just where would you serve. Here's my question for you. Why do you believe? Why do you believe? If somebody asked you, are you ready to explain it? Can you say the difference that the gospel or that Jesus has made in your life? Can you say, can, can you, have you, are there questions you've wrestled with that you continue to wrestle down so you can explain to others the light that by grace you've come to see about these tough questions? Are you ready to speak? Uh, not everyone is called to go on the lecture circuit. All of us are called to be ready to give an account for what we believe to share the good news of Christ. Three things, I said. Christian mission is joining a spirit-led movement. It's making a reasonable argument. Last thing, it's engaging in spiritual combat. Now, this is the weird part, isn't it? There is a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. He seems to have been some kind of a mix, a Jewish sorcerer. He was blending together religions. He created his own designer religion, we might say today. And he had the attention. He was an attendant of Sergius Paulus. And uh, there is no question where he is at on this. When, when Sergius Paulus wants to hear the word of God, immediately, it says in verse 8, Elymas, it's his other name, Elymas the sorcerer, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. And when Paul speaks to him, speaks of him, in verse 10, he says, you're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Before that, he says, you are a child of the devil. Now, what is going on here? It's not just making a reasonable argument. That's necessary. That's what Paul mainly does. But here we have the reality that in this world, it is not a neutral plane for making a reasonable argument that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is uh, deceit and trickery. There is opposition. There is spiritual opposition rated, uh, uh, seated in high places, Paul might say elsewhere. The, we, we are used these days to this kind of trickery uh, and deceit 
We use words today like propaganda, disinformation, fake news, deception, cover-up, suppression of the truth. You heard anything about those things lately? <laughs> People trying to spin, cloud, a cover-up, twist, distort. Guess what? There's a first century version. In fact, believe it or not, this goes back even further to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, first ministry of propaganda. Satan came to Eve and told her a lie about God. She believed it. To go out and to make the case, to go out on the mission of God, to go out and make the case for Christian faith uh, means that we are going to be engaging in spiritual uh, combat, kind of like a spiritual brawl. And in fact, um, this is this even given a picture of this in this whole thing about blindness. Uh, Elymas, after Paul speaks to him, uh, he says to him he's going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. He has, a, he has a, some kind of temporary blindness. And then it says in verse 12, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Most scholars would say this is playing on the theme throughout Scripture of spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness. Jesus, throughout his ministry, had compassion on the physically blind. In fact, it was one of the things that marked him as the Messiah. He gave sight to the blind. These miracles were a sign of the coming new heavens and new earth, when with his resurrection power, he will make all things new. Jesus had compassion regularly on those who were physically blind. What he said was more dangerous and more destructive was to be spiritually blind. Jesus said in John 9, 39, For judgment I have come into the world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. He's speaking of spiritual issues. He's speaking particularly of those who stubbornly and persistently opposed him and lied about him. There is a kind of blindness that is rooted in spiritual forces of deception and indeed rooted in our own stubborn hearts. Have you ever noticed that if you don't want to see something, you can be pretty good at not seeing it? If you don't want to hear something, you can be pretty good at not hearing it? You can lead a horse to water, the old saying goes. You can't make him drink. There's a stubbornness, a spiritual stubbornness rooted deep in human hearts. My dad um, was a wonderfully stubborn man. It was part of his charm. Uh, he, would, he, would, he would just insist that certain things were true and certain things were not. He's a big-sized personality. He, he insisted throughout his life that he did not like yogurt, like even frozen yogurt that tastes just like ice cream. He loved ice cream. He did not like yogurt. We went once, our whole family, we, went to the, we were on a road trip, and we stopped at a little uh, roadside place, and we all got this like, soft-serve ice cream. It wasn't ice cream. It was yogurt. We all knew that. He didn't know it. He started eating it. We're all looking, and eventually my sisters, my mom, somebody cracks a smile. He la he's like, what's going on? He, says, he said, you like that, Dad? He says, yeah, I like it. What's going on? Says, That's yogurt. He says, I don't like it. And he threw it away. <laughs> he said, Dad, you liked it a second ago. You don't I don't like it. And it was the end of the discussion. I don't like it. I don't like yogurt. That's it. Right. Now, it was, again, it was part of his charm. Lots of great stories about my dad. But you know, we can, we can do that about all kinds of things. I don't like it. I refuse it. And how much more when the message of the gospel is not just, it, it is wonderfully this, it is not just there is a risen Savior who will forgive you and save you and bring you into His presence for eternity, but the gospel is also He is risen Lord who will command your life, who will lead you in the right way that may not be the way you want to go. Do you want to hear a message that says, you don't get to do what you want. You need to follow Jesus the Lord. I can guarantee you in every one of our hearts there's a stubbornness that says, I don't like that. And how do you break through that? And then the Scripture says there are spiritual forces in high places ready to feed us all kinds of reasons why indeed it is not true. To share this gospel is to engage in spiritual combat, which means two things. One, it means we need help. We need to pray. 
We need to pray for the Gospel to open, to soften hard hearts, to, to, to give spiritual light and open ears and to, to help our words speak to the hearts of people with whom we share this good news. We need to pray dependently, regularly, that God would work through us. And it also means that we have hope. That hope is not in us, but in the God who deep before the foundation of the world determined that this mission is not our mission, it's His mission we get to be a part of. Who is committed to this mission, Father, Son, and Spirit. And who is able to open hearts and minds. This is what it says, 2 Corinthians 4, 1-6. through I wonder if Paul was thinking about it this instance from Acts 13. You can read it later if you want, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 verses. But in that passage it says this, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. In other words, we have hope that other people can see the glory of Jesus because for some reason we see the glory of Jesus. Because Jesus has opened our eyes, not because we're so much better than anyone else, but because by His grace, for reasons we don't understand, at some point our eyes were open, our hearts were open, we saw Jesus and we saw Him as glorious. And that's a miracle that God is not stopping doing and He can use us to do in the hearts and minds and lives of others. This is Christian mission. Joining a Spirit-led movement, making a reasonable argument, engaging in spiritual conflict. And we're coming now to the table of communion. I'm going to invite you in just a second. I'll give instructions. We'll invite you to come forward and to take the bread and the cup and what this table is, I'll read from Acts, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in just a second. What this table says, Paul says it says something. Whenever you take the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim something. Here's part of what you proclaim. You proclaim Jesus, most importantly, you proclaim Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. But also wonderfully, as you get up, we'll invite you to get up and to come forward. You say, I'm joining the movement. I'm a part of what God is doing. I recommit myself to being a part of what this Jesus who so graciously saved me is doing in my life and in this world. As we prepare to take communion, as we prepare to invite you to come forward, we we'll take just a moment of quiet prayer and invite you to prepare your heart to take communion. If there are things that need to be made right in your life, need to be confessed, I invite you to do that at this time. And even I invite you to use this as a moment to ask the Lord what He would have you do, where He would have you go, how He would have you serve. Let's pray.